Okay, it's, are you seeing that I started the recording? Oh, there it is, perfect. I'm like, <laughs> it didn't pop up for me at first. So um, so what I'll do, welcome everyone. Um, this is our August Advisory Committee on Aging meeting. Um, today it's really focused on the um, phase two of public safety. Um, as mentioned, Angelique, um, our interim chair is gonna be late. So I'll just uh, kick it off with roll call. Um, I know Tom is not on unless I'm missing you. Tom, are you here? Flo, I know you're here. I just talked to you. So, and I know you, um, I, I just had a, a dental surgery, so you don't have to say here. I know you're here because <laughs> I know it hurts. Uh, Melinda. Present. Janet. Paulette? Yep, I'm here. Hazel? Present. Um, Angelique will be late. Alain? Present. And Beth? Here. All right, well. And, hey, I'm Janet, I'm here. I'm here, <laughs> even though I would, I couldn't get myself off mute when, <laughs> when you call my name. <laughs> I saw, <laughs> perfect, perfect. Um, okay, before we uh, start, does anyone, we do have a quorum present. Um, does anyone have uh, any questions before we start with what um, the process is? I know we've had this conversation before um, when they did phase one of public safety and we spent some time. So I really appreciate everyone's uh, willingness to um, work with me and to go down with these questions. Um, so I'm just gonna start off unless there's anything anyone wants to say first. Okay. Um, so since last summer regarding the city's efforts at reimagining public safety, what have you liked and what have you not liked? Do you want to have a speaking order? That we can uh, no, not necessarily. You can um, raise your hand or... I'll, I'll go first. Okay, perfect. And then we'll do Beth. The, um, I like the concept of having um, healthcare or mental health responders and decreasing um, the armed police from attending those incidents. Um, what I don't like is the fact that there hasn't been, um, I don't feel that the uh, ballot measure has been very well described. That it, uh, they say they're going to do these things, but I I need to know the steps that they're going to go, not okay. just a gentle outline. Okay, thank you, Beth. I couldn't agree more. Um, you're exactly right, my opinion, and many others. That um, I mean, I love the idea that. Um, mental health or safety officers, whatever the word is. I mean, we're so caught up in words, unfortunately. I mean, if it's called a counselor maybe or an officer, but any any public safety personnel versus an armed um, police officer who hasn't had mental health training or counseling training necessarily, or at least, a, I mean, maybe if it was communicated, if officers were showing up, what their background is, what are the training protocols? I think that there needs to be more transparency. I think there needs to be a clear plan on what the city would like to do for officers or counselors and who would be showing up and what, and maybe give examples of who would be showing up. I think it would be very helpful if people felt though that they still could be protected somehow that there are and maybe not just call them police call them public safety officers and maybe there are different categories of public safety officers i mean everyone wants the same thing really regardless of where they live or what their situation is or what their background is they want their family safe they want to feel safe and they want help when they need it whether it's mental health or or physical health and so if there was a clear understanding of what the plan was, I think, um, and what people were voting on, certainly, I think that would be helpful. Um, I like that there's been talk about that change needs to be made. I don't like that there seems to be such an uptick in crime um, 
and I, I mean, who would? Um, but it really does seem, and I don't know if it's because things like the Citizen app, and I don't know if um, any of you get those Citizen app notifications, but it's been pretty shocking how many carjackings there have been recently and how many um, people, you know, I know there's always been crime, but it, it seems to me that it is there are more people in need of help and that there are more incidents um, of crime and of officers not responding. And I don't know if that's because they don't want to respond as much if people are call, afraid to call police officers now or if there just isn't the staff. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, um, I was a victim of crime between last the last uh, meeting and this meeting. Mm -hmm. I was robbed. Uh, so I have personal experience with um, my own public safety. Um, and I, I, I agree. I, this, my, my wallet was stolen. It took three hours for a, a police officer to, to come. It wasn't considered a robbery. I consider it an invasion and an act of aggression because somebody jumped into the back seat of my car while I was in the car and took my wallet. Um, so I've been in the last two weeks um, replacing everything and it's, it's, you know, it's a major inconvenience, but it wasn't a physical assault on me. It was a professional job. The person was, uh, I was at the Seward co-op. The person 15 minutes after was already at Target uh, trying to cash in. And when I did talk to the police, they said, oh, that's typical. Um, they all, all, all of that kind of crime, they all go to Target. It's a big box store. That's where they can cash in. So, um, but in terms of the whole debate going on, swirling around um, public safety, um, I think uh, we, we almost might be better served for it not even to be on the ballot in November. Uh, because it is so fraught with um, misunderstanding. Now, um, I have not liked any of the conversation about comparing Minneapolis to Portland, Oregon, to Newark, New Jersey, uh, to Austin, Texas. Those are all, all uh, ma major metropolitan areas that have had this experience. Austin, Texas has had a terrible experience. Newark has had a better experience. And somehow or another, Minneapolis seems to be the petri dish of the nation right now. And I don't like the whole emphasis on, oh, we'll just experiment and see how it goes. I think that is not going to serve anybody's interests. So public safety is um, uh, on everybody's mind and um i i think that it i really really think that it's possible that it won't be on the ballot in november and and perhaps that would be a, the best thing well so. i can i can assure you it, it, it is on the ballot but it might not be no nope, there, there may be a special election mm -hmm. there they a judge it's being appealed right now it's sure. in it's being appealed right now, and um, there may it may ha be um, consigned to a special election. That may happen. So I mean, that hasn't been determined yet. That's yet to be determined. But that's the problem with this whole public safety debate to be determined. I mean, there are no clear cut answers, and people don't appreciate that. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask quickly who is the uh, 203 number that joined us? That's Tom Weiss. I had I have had trouble signing in, and so I have um, just came in on the telephone. Okay. Um, nice to see you, Tom. Um, yeah. Can, can you let me know in minutes who's present? Um, yep. I will tell you right now, and thank you for taking um, notes. I really, really appreciate that. And I also want to make sure that you have an opportunity to give your input as well. Um, the people who are present besides yourself are Flo, Melinda, Janet, Paulette, Hazel, Alain, and Beth. And Angelique should be joining us shortly, but as of now, she is not here. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, um, this is Janet. Um, I think I, I agree with what everybody has said. I, I I'm a, actually I, I'm working for this for the amendment. Um, uh, hoping actually hoping it gets on the ballot. I really wished it got on the ballot last year. I really wanted to see it on the ballot last year. I didn't want it be to be dragged out a year here because I really felt it would muddy the waters, and it really has. I'm afraid. Um, my feeling is that we, as much help as the police are now, um, if we got a little help on homicide investigation from um, another jurisdiction, I think that would that would at least um, be probably as much police help as we're getting right now. Um, people who have their cars stolen are getting them back without any of the evidence being processed at all. So, um, and basically they're finding their own cars in the impound lot is where they're finding them. So, uh, so there really hasn't been help on finding the cars or, or on uh, uh, finding out who did it. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I mean, I think they did. And, and also, I really, I, I think I really want to see this passed because I don't really think the mayor is the one that should be in charge of um, a public safety department simply because um, a, a totalitarian mayor could leave us in a very, very bad situation. Um, and there wouldn't be very much that the city council could do about it. They'd be fairly helpless. Um, so anyway, that, that's kind of kind of where I'm coming from, and I, I'm I'm working actively for it. I hope it gets on the ballot. Uh, I'm I'm with Paulette on not being sure that it will. That um, uh, the people who are contesting it legally are going to go down. They're they're trying to go down, and and time it out as far as um. um you know, by contesting it past the time when it needs to be on the ballot and the ballots need to be printed. So um, anyway, okay, that's all I have to say, I guess, for now. Okay. Does anybody want to add anything, like um, what changes you want to see in the next uh, year and who you think should be responsible for implementing those changes? I like the idea of the mayor working with the city council, not the city council choosing or the mayor choosing, but working in conjunction together, you know, kind of like if you look at Congress, ideally working with the president, at least getting some some semblance of um, bipartisanship or, I mean, even if they're the same part, it shouldn't matter party. Public safety is a health issue. It's a mental health issue. It's a safety issue. I mean, everyone should, there shouldn't be division, ideally. Right. Thank you. I, I'm afraid that if we go to a committee making decisions, that it will take forever for us to reach uh, an agreement on the changes that are necessary. I would agree. I see no way that uh, a 13 member city council can handle um, administering what has not even been determined yet. Um, we don't know what what the new how the new city council is going to be. Uh, who's going to be on it and who isn't and um, they're, 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 they're certainly not collegial that that would be <laughs> There's no no ability for them to reach any kind of consensus. And I feel I, very, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say that I vote for Beth's bipartisan arrangement, where they actually, the mayor has to sort of answer to the council. The council gets to decide. Or that's, that's how I took it. That's what we have now. Yeah, or maybe, I mean, at least, at least they, they somehow, I, I mean, maybe the mayor has the, final say but has to take the advice somehow or there has to be a two-thirds vote something like the way congress and the president works together where there's representation and um compromise ideally and what is going to go so we're having this conversation what difference does it make where is it going 
So this is, yep. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, the Office of Violence Prevention, um, who um, has been leading the the reform for public safety, the work. Um, this is phase two of their engagement. They've collected the first round of data, um, and, and you know we had that conversation before. And so from that first round, that's why they're diving deeper into these questions, um, kind of asking more targeted questions versus the overall, like, what do you think about even changing our public safety? Um, like, they want to know where are we, where, you know, where do you go to get your information on public safety? You know, questions like that. So this is being collected, and that's why, again, I so appreciate Tom taking notes. I'm trying to, I'm scribbling, I'm scribbling all over here. So <laughs> I can't beat Tom's uh, acumen at, at taking notes. So, um, so yes, these will be um, collected by the Office of Violence Prevention. Um, I'm leading two other conversations myself um, with um, a group of LGBTQ plus elders, as well as with the uh, Advisory Committee on Disabilities. Which we'll touch. We'll touch on that if we have time at the end. We'll talk about that. And Melinda also brought up um, a survey that was sent out, um, and I would love to share with you so you can get it out to your networks. Yeah, this so is Tom. Kind of track. <laughs> yep, go ahead, Tom. This is Tom. I mean, my concern about it is I just don't see that the proposal will change anything because, as I see it, the problem is the cops. And I don't see how we can replace, what, 500, 600 cops? And I don't see, I mean, we can't fill up the positions we have now. I don't see how we could replace it. And it seems to me that until there is a, a change in the, in, the, in the officers out there, I mean, the stories that came out this last week about the officers going out during the George Floyd thing and, and the and the acquittal of, of the man who was responding to their unprovoked fire at him, um, I just don't see how you're going to change anything until until the officers themselves change. And I don't, you know, changing the management is is not in any practical way going to change the people we have out on the streets. Thank you. I am curious about this question they're asking about where do you all get your information about the efforts of the city trying to, they call it reimagining public safety is the, the term, the title. Or do you not, or is that like. <laughs> so where do we get our information you're saying? About the efforts of the city's. Office of Violence Prevention and any other efforts to reimagine public safety. I mean, I get emails from the city that are like city of Minneapolis updates. I get my city council person emails. So I get a lot of Minneapolis newsletters. I read the Star Tribune. I read the Minnesota, what's it called? M-I-N-N -N post online. Um, so those are kind of my main local sources. Okay. And also on social media, I follow um, the city, um, various local elected officials, a lot of, you know, on on Twitter, Facebook, those are, I guess, the main places. Sure. I just basically read Liz Navratil. She's the <laughs> bottom line. She's the most authoritative source of information, the Star Tribune reporter for the city council. and. And uh, that's that's my bottom line. And I am incidentally turned off by words like reimagining public safety. Okay. That is a turn off, uh, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, it just doesn't resonate. You know, that that is just it's just too loosey goosey a, a term for me. So, and holistic is another one that turns me off. <laughs> okay, I don't read the Star and Tribune because they have a paywall and I refuse to pay for my news. 
I will go around. I will look at their headline and then go around and find the same story from a different source that doesn't charge me <laughs> if I have to. Um, uh, I get stuff from the city, but also I'm also getting stuff from Black Visions and three or four other organizations that are working for the amendment. So. And I just wanted to remind everyone, we have to um, refrain from using our chat um, for conversation. I can put like the agenda and the questions in, but um, with open meeting law, we're not allowed to have conversation with the chat because the public can't see it. Um, okay, thank you. Anybody else have anything to add before we move on to um, what is happening in your respective communities? Um, as far as uh, community led safety strategies that are being implemented, if if any, um, if there's not, you know, feel free to share that too. And do you like what's going on in your community, you know, with your community's efforts or you don't feel that, that if there is efforts that they're working? Um, go ahead, Melinda. Um, the Kingfield neighborhood is organizing, I, I think it's tonight, uh, a, a meeting and it's being archived. Uh, um, they're asking the city clerk to appear before the neighborhood who are interested in uh, explaining the, the amendment as it will, or the thing that will appear on the ballot and mm -hmm. answering those questions. So our neighborhood is looking at it kind of in a broad view. Sure. Yeah, the Southeast Como neighborhood is doing this, uh, something similar. Not tonight, but it's coming up. Sure. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Melinda. Anyone else? I'm an at-large person for the committee, so my yeah, view is... You can, you can share with, like, if you're a particular community where you live, um, if you're aware of any efforts. I'm not right now, although... Honestly, I have been gone for a month, so <laughs> but I haven't been getting emails saying, you know, come to this public safety thing. OK, thank you. Um, thinking about community and neighborhoods where you live, um, what does policing look like? Um, is it working? Is it not working? What is the relationship in your perspective, in your respective communities with law enforcement? I can say recently on next door in the um, community feedback recently, especially in um, Southwest Minneapolis, people have been kind of up in arms about all the crime that's been going on and a lack of response from officers. Okay. Anyone else? I would second that in the um, South Minneapolis neighborhoods that on my next door hail that people are very disturbed with um, <laughs> for a couple of uh, there's a home broken into um, by field recently while someone was in the house uh, <clears throat> the lack of police showing up or not showing up for hours and then a lot of catalytic converter tests that <clears throat> are just not being yeah and increasingly there have been a lot of, I mean, historically, people's cars get broken into, especially when they're left unlocked. But lately, there have been people going into people's garages while people are in the car before they get out of the car to take the car and then strip it. But, you know, actively engaging with individuals in their own garages. Yeah, and that happened to me last October. And, um, but they weren't interested in my car, they were interested in my purse. Oh my God. I, I, did my was, oh, I was just going to say I did what you're supposed to do after you're a victim of crime um, and um, went through all the steps, filed a police report. It took the police three hours to come um, and it was in a parking lot. So it was all on security film. So the, the evidence was there. There was a picture of him. And um, but when I called the desk sergeant, I was told it's probably never going to rise to the it was not going to rise to the level. It might 
be assigned to an investigator, but probably not because um, it's just it just wasn't there. There's police are stretched so thin. So if you wonder why there's no, you know, immediate response, three hours, I was not considered top, top priority. So that that is what it is. We had a, 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 a similar event, a robbery in our neighborhood where someone took garbage out at about 10 o'clock at night and three um, people followed her back in the car and had guns. Um, she was buying a house, had bought a house in the neighborhood for her daughter and was cleaning it up and the daughter was in the basement cleaning. And this is about 10 o'clock at night. And the three got, took her keys, all keys, her credit card, her debit card and demanded the pin number. But they didn't know the daughter was in the basement and the daughter called police and police responded and a lot of them rather quickly. Um, the culprits were gone, but they there was a car chase and the car was stopped um, over on the West Bank. Um, and at least one culprit was arrested. It could be that they they weren't from this neighborhood and came in one car and only one guy was in the stolen car. But there was a quick. Yeah, I, um, but they but there was a quick response on that. And what area is that? Southeast Minneapolis. Okay, Janet, you had something to say to me. Yeah, uh, my neighborhood's kind of mixed. Uh, um, for I think the homeowners, it's kind of like what people have been saying, um, but there seems to be plenty of, of police power to harass street people yet. So it's so, so it's kind of a mixed bag. Okay, thank you. Um, any more comments before we move on to the... Um, about the broader Minneapolis community, although we kind of just went around and talked about that. Um, and what would you change about the community and police relations? I think that if there were local officers in each community that actively walked streets and got to know people, not harassed people, but, you know, helped helped carry heavy things, helped move things if someone needed help, helped be friendly and got to know some of the people. Um, and maybe that's happening and I don't know it, but um, I think community partnerships, transparency, um, involvement, support goes far. Anyone else? Hazel? I got to unmute myself. Um, I agree with what Beth just said. I mean, it has to do with, with training uh, police officers and how to work to communicate. Like Beth said, I think a lot of them, and I don't know for sure, are not of the community, so they don't know the people. Um, and so the, the best way to do it, I mean, and the training has to start from the top down. I mean, because if you have a... a, a the top that doesn't care about community and the rest of the office is going to follow suit because they're going to follow what's the, the, the function of the part of the of the department. So if the whole department has to change the attitude about community relations, um, so they have to, I mean, sorry, because police is just like the, um, what do you used to call the people on the plantation, the overseers. I mean, so that's kind of where the history of it is coming from. And so I think they still had that kind of mindset um, you know, overseeing and, and, and being over empowering the people instead of working with the people. So yeah, they need to walk the beat, become part of activities that's in the neighborhoods to get to know the people. And actively I recruit. Appreciate, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I just really appreciate Crafts and Gamble's new, um, and the new commercials that they're showing with people of color. Um, you know, as humans, I mean, so they're not, so the guy that's driving the car, the hat turned back, you know, he's going to see his mama or something. And so they're showing the hum, human part of people of color. And I think that's, if they should have more of that kind of stuff on the TVs also. But the training, but basic training of the whole police department. And, and then I think use of, um, like they said, the adjunct uh, mental health counselors along with the police department. So if you have a, 
crisis and mental health crisis here the council is going to go out but i would be hesitant to send a council out by themselves there should be a police with them in case of but <sighs> but the counselor would, would be leading the discussion with, the, with interacting with the the client that's who may be having a crisis mental crisis um so it needs to be it's, a, it's not and but it's an and and with so it's not one side one method is not going to be for everything so we've got to be all inclusive thank you hazel janet your hands up yeah um i think we have to almost really start over because the current police department is had such a culture of white supremacy that it's almost impossible to get young people and people of color to join it um uh, so um yeah, I mean, they don't want to come and just be harassed and, and, and you know, uh, really endangered. I mean, their lives end up being endangered because if, if the rest of the police won't, won't support them and back them up. So um, it, it's really necessary to really start over and, and, um, start with start with people who are who really are sincerely concerned about public safety not just in you know being in a position to bully others that's not really a very realistic approach how do you dump the baby out with the bathwater? how do you in fact how do you start over by replacing an entire police force what happens in the interim you cannot do that I would rather have no murderers. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> well, that's that's not realistic. You do not replace an entire police force. What happens to a community in the interim? I don't care if it's six weeks or six months. You have to have some kind of po police force. Would you rather have the National Guard come in? Would you rather have the U.S. Department of Justice send in um, the Army while we take the time to train and replace an entire police force? We, you have to be realistic. You cannot do I, 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 would, I wouldn't say that either one of those uh, um, alternatives would be worse than what we've got right now. Well, then perhaps that's what we should reimagine. The National Guard here for the next six months. Or army occupation because that's the alternative beth i see your hand up and i want to welcome angelique hi angelique um <laughs> yeah i think that I, I i hear both of what you both are i hear what both of you are saying i i hope we all can agree that there are some good officers that are in the mix as well as there are some terrible officers um I would hope that I don't I I do think it's unrealistic to just say we're going to get rid of 100% of the people. Um, but I do think there's something where starting from scratch, every officer who wants to continue in the force, that there's some educational program where there are some people who are trained in counseling and working with diverse communities say like from now on every officer goes through this training and it can't just be a token training it needs to be a real education training more i know you don't like this word paulette but holistic like a very thorough not just you know how to arrest people not just how to hold them but you know how to de-escalate how to work together with a safety program and if there was something transparent where you could see oh here's the training program oh here's what everybody goes through oh here are the you know the kind of the things that we all our values of what this organization is and if i'm going to be one of these officers whether it's called a public safety officer or a mental health officer or whatever we call it um that they adhere to these values and they aspire to live them throughout you know their work and as part of the community hazel i see your hand yeah. is up i think you're on mute hazel and then That's we'll go to you um, I agree with that. The training um, has to be that the, not the office is not just looking outside of themselves. They got to look within themselves and how they bring in their implicit biases when they deal with people who don't look like them. So that training, if it doesn't incorporate for them looking at themselves and getting the, the myths and the stereotypes out of their vision 
when they're dealing with people who don't look like them, then nothing's going to change. This is one of the reasons why I stopped doing diversity training. Like you said, you have the training, but they go back to square one when they leave. It's a checkoff. They've done it for two hours, and they wait till next year, and they come back and do it again. But if there's no follow-up, if this training has to have follow-up, in three months, what have I what have I done to improve my behavior working with people of color? Six months, nine months, 12 months. So if you don't see any improvement in that officer, something's wrong with the training. Because you need to, in, in all that time, they should have some kind of introspective look at how they're dealing with the community. How am I, what is my role in causing more problems and this and, and stuff escalating? So that's my that's my, my soapbox. They've got to look at themselves. This can't be an outside thing uh, when they're doing the training. Thank you. We'll go to Paulette and then Beth and then Melinda. No, I just had a brainstorm. Okay, if we're gonna have mandatory training, I don't care if it's six weeks, six months, whatever, let's carve out at least a month internship. Every Minneapolis officer has to go to another jurisdiction, to another city where there's already been like New Jersey in Newark or in um, Austin, Texas, where it hasn't worked very well, uh, or Portland, Oregon. Then they can really experience what it's like where it's either working or it's not working, hopefully where it's working. But, you know, shed the garment of being in Minnesota and go and work in a jurisdiction where it's already working in an internship and get a new perspective without their buddies. Because in a lot of in a lot of ways, it's it's a very, very closed community, the, the police force. And if they're taken out of their environment after they go through a mandatory training and put into another setting where they don't have any buddies to tra trade stories with, wouldn't that be interesting? Thank you, Paulette. Um, Beth and then Melinda. I think Sorry. you're on. I, I am. Um, Hazel made me think when um, that also, you know, teachers have to go back for continuing education um, because things change in the world. So the idea of not only going through a training, whether it's an empathy training or whatever we're calling this training, um, at the beginning of their career, it should also happen as an ongoing um, kind of touchstone throughout their career. Thank and maybe you, even think. have, you know, meetings. Um, well, I mean, I'm not going to get into what the syllabus should be, but but having it be ongoing. Thank you, Melinda. I, I, oh, go. We'll do Melinda and then Tom, because I, I know you. I think there's a, a, a some other overarching issues for this whole uh, conversation, and one is the union um, and how it operates and how it restricts what the police chief can do, um, how information about officers is posted or not posted and kept secret um, so that, um, and discipline is often overturned by that the board or, the, or whatever, however those cases get forwarded. Um, um, the police chief decides they wanna fire up an officer for behavior or, or action, and then it gets overturned um, um, at the next level. And so I think there's some other issues beyond um, what the city council has control over uh, and the mayor that um, impact um, what happens and how officers who shouldn't be on the force are kept. Thank you, Melinda. We'll go to Tom and then Paulette. I was just gonna answer to Beth, uh, to the best of my knowledge, um, officers have to do a certain number of continuing education uh, hours every year or every three years, just like teachers and actually like lawyers. It's called post credits that they have to get a certain number of. Um, so there is continuing training. It's not working very well. Right, they need a better program. <laughs> Thank you both. Uh, Paulette, go ahead. Yeah, well, by the same token, what I, what I suggested about uh, new officers going into another jurisdiction, we should also receive officers from other jurisdictions who have already had experience. Um, and work work in a in a collegial kind of a exchange program instead of it just being you know sending our I mean it would take a lot of effort to to negotiate that I'm sure 
would be very tough to do, but hey, you might as well think outside the box. Thank you. So Angelique, <laughs> we've been diving into the questions. Um, and right now we are talking about community police relations. Um, and I sent you the questions, so feel free to, um, you know, if you've got stuff that you want to add from the beginning, um, uh, we can definitely take it um, to Office of Violence Prevention. So um, um, if you want to any, add anything, Angelique, if not, I'll move on to the next question, which is interesting. Um, Can you see me and hear me? Yep. Yeah. Is it wavy? Nope. Uh, nope. Nope. Are you there? You seem to be locking up a little bit, though. All right. I think she's going to move into a different internet access area. Um, I will move on. Um, Taking a moment to recognize the trial of Derek Chauvin, do you see the trial creating routes for policy change? Or basically, has the trial, if at all, changed your perceptions of reimagining public safety? And we can, I there, if there's, I know it's it's a it's a unique mm -hmm. question. I I'm going to kind of paraphrase and I'm hoping I'm not going off their their intention. Um, but clearly what happened with the murder of George Floyd and then the subsequent um, arrest and, and trial of Derek Chauvin and there's other officers too, um, kind of brought front and center globally <laughs> uh, the issues within the city of Minneapolis and our law enforcement. Um, do you think that the trial opened up and, and the fact that uh, the officer was prosecuted um, created routes for policy change? If so, do you, you know, do you have an example of what policy changes? Because um, I do, you know, I don't know if you've heard, but um, police chief uh, Arredondo, he, um, did along with the mayor put uh, put in some different policies such as uh, not uh, the officers are not allowed to they're not supposed to stop uh, individuals for like a light out or for things hanging from their mirror etc um, and then how was the trial if at all how, did it change your perception of reimagining public safety um, well, I, I mean, I certainly think that bringing it to a larger stage, uh, I know that some changes at state, some of the things that we have a problem with are state law, that there's some really bad state laws that prevent us from disciplining police and, and calling, um, uh, you know, accountability. But, uh, and some some laws were introduced, however, none of them passed because of the Senate, the Senate stalled them. So, um, but at least some of these issues were brought to light. So anyway. That was quite a walk, Anjali. <laughs> Paulette, did you have something to say? You're on mute. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think out of the Chauvin trial, um, new new officers who are on duty with an established officer, like Derek Chauvin, are now um, empowered to be able to um, make the a judgment that this is not appropriate. You have to stop this. Um, we weren't trained to do this. Um, and that's a change because of the hi the hierarchy of, of the chain of command, better way to phrase it, um, would not have allowed um, a lower ranking or an, a very new officer to 
say, I'm not participating in this, I'm stepping back. Uh, we weren't trained to do this. So um, I think that may, um, I think that, at least that's my impression that that, that has been instituted as a change. Um, and, and, and if so, the chain of command um, needs to be looked at and strengthened so that when, when an event like this happens, it's not going to be impossible for a lower ranking officer to say, stop, this is not how we were trained. Yeah, and I think it allows allowed for some positive change and maybe open the door to a bit of hope, hopefully. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone else before I move on? You guys are doing wonderful. This is a, there's a lot of questions, but we are getting close to the end. I did I I did watch a training um, uh, about what Paulette was. Um, talking about and to watch the body language of some of the officers during that training you know very well that they aren't going to be um, they're not going to be applying what what they were taught because um, yeah they're not absorbing it in their bodies <laughs> let's put it that way thank you um, Melinda and then Ellen I think it raised awareness um, around the world about the state of public safety. And I think this was a, a, um, a, a, a call to action that we need, something needs to change. And I mean, it was coverage in New York Times, Washington Post, a lot of television news programming, uh, analyzing and people weighing in on we need to change how public safety is, is conducted in Minneapolis and Minnesota and in our country and around the world. And so I think um, um, that's a good thing. Now, whether we follow through on any of that is another thing. And as was pointed out, our state legislature didn't let this go forward. I mean, there's politics of all of this involved, as well as strong unions and uh, weak uh, mayors and, and, and city councils and you know all of that is all wrapped up in this. And yet um, I, I'm hopeful that something can change and be better. And I appreciate the members of our community or people of color who are, are speaking up for their communities and, and opening my eyes to, I don't have the same experience and I need to know what that other experience is to have a have a better understanding of where we need to go forward. So um, I, I think that the level of awareness is raised and I think that's a good thing. But the proof is in the pudding is if we're if we're going to get accomplish anything with this particular measure on our ballot. Sorry, Ellen and then Hazel. <laughs> Spend the whole meeting so this, people are on mute. <laughs> I think um, I think that the uh, the fact that the witnesses were heard and believed was very rewarding. I, I felt that it perhaps showed people that um, that they could have an impact, that they could uh, they could question the police's narrative, and and it happened at least in this trial. It doesn't happen in all of them. Thank you, Hazel. I mean, I agree, I agree with, with Melinda, but I think that what part with George Floyd is that Ms. Frazier videotaped it. Had not the videotape been there, we wouldn't be where we are now. Um, so uh, she did the world a favor by doing that. I know it's traumatic for her to deal with that, and I'm glad that she's getting counseling for it. But without that, we wouldn't be where we are now. But I want to say that I think to see the effect of all of this worldwide people now have become more conscious and are not going to just stand by and let things continue the way it has in the past so i think you're seeing more and more people confronting um the police and what they're doing to people of color so you're seeing more and more of that you know in the news and people are not standing by idly letting it continue to happen so that's a good part of that but the sad part of that is that we still got to go through 
a lot of more black men dying in the hands of the police. Um, but until, and whoever was saying the training, if they don't start looking within, things are not going to change. And so everybody know, I mean, I dare say you stop any Caucasian on the street, but you trade places with a black person, the immediate answer is going to be no, because you know what's happening with us. And so that's, that's the bottom line. If you can put yourself in our places, then you will help us to get to where we need to get to go. We can't do it by ourselves. You guys have to speak up as well as us. We've been saying this since I've been born, from my mama's time. This is not nothing new. This hasn't been in our life 24 seven since we got here. But just put yourself in our place. You don't want to spend 24 hours as being a black person in America and you know it. Because you know what's happening to us. So sometimes you, you, you run, you got, you got tunnel vision. You know, this is not my, my lane. I don't see it. Open your eyes and see it because it's happening every day. Every day we walk, we have to walk in, in fright, turning our heads, making sure, even just a simple fact of crossing the street. I'm not going to cross the street without looking left and right two or three times. You watch a Caucasian cross the street. They on their phone, twisting, talking, looking straight ahead. They don't look left or right. And I'm looking at this and saying, how can you be that confident? Privilege. That's privilege. You know you're not going to get hit. I, I don't need to look at my environment. Something just as simple as that. And when you take your next drive out, check it out. And you can see a black person going to look left and right a couple of times before they cross the street. White person walking straight ahead. No turn to the head at all. That's one. That's just one piece of what we're dealing with. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Ms. Hazel. Um, Alain, did you have your hand up still or? Anyone else before I move on? This this next thing is going to be, um, I'll have to probably repeat it a couple of times because they're asking to, um, if you were in charge, and we all like that, right? <laughs> but if we were in charge, if you were in charge, um, how would you rank this as a um, priority? And I'll list them off. There's four of them. There's prevention of violence. Response to nonviolent crime by uh, co-responder or community centered response. Response to violent crime being a police response. Police reform. So I'll say it one more time. Prevention of violence is one. Response to nonviolent crimes with a co-responder community centered response is two. Response to violent crime as a police response is the third suggestion or police reform. And which do you think is your number one priority? And who do you feel is responsible for it? And um, what would look what would that look like to you? So if you picked police reform, what would that look like to you? And who should address police reform? If, you, if that would be your top priority as an example. Mine would be police reform. That would be the, the, the bubble up because this is where the concerns are. Who would be responsible? I think be the chief and the union personnel. I mean, if you don't start there, because I, I think as Melinda talked about, you know, the, the, the power that the union has uh, with police. So the whole umbrella has to be the, the training of, the, of that whole section there. So it's, who's responsible would be the chief and the union to make those changes in their department. If they don't see that they have a problem, then that's a problem. Thank you, Ms. Hazel. Beth, I see your hand up and then Angelique. Um, first of all, Hazel, you speak so eloquently and and your words are um, always appreciated. And and I agree with you. Um, <laughs> and um, I, I think that if police reform comes first, done properly, then prevention of violence, response to nonviolent crime, response to violent crime falls into place. Those other things, I mean, prevention of violence should be part of police reform. All those things should fall into place if police reform is done correctly. Thank you, Beth. Angelique and then Janet. 
So would this be just to clarify these priorities? Would they be our recommendation to? Is it for the Office of Violence Prevention or is it specifically for the police force? Nope. So the, um, so this is phase two of the Office of Violence Prevention's um, community engagement and outreach to get more input, um, which is why the questions are a little bit of a deeper dive than the first round when we have these conversations. And so all of this will be uh, turned over to the Office of Violence Prevention. Um, there are other community meetings happening all throughout the city. Um, I mentioned I was doing, um, I have two more. I'm, I'm doing one with the Advisory Committee on People with Disabilities uh, while my uh, colleague is out with paternity leave. And I will also be doing a community group with LGBTQ plus elders. So, um, so there are definitely other committees and communities that will be having the, this exact conversations. And these questions were developed by the Office of Violence Prevention. Okay, so with that being said, because I just wanted to make sure I wasn't offering up something that doesn't apply to the, you know. So for me, What's what's speaking to me the most and is on my heart of, is is violence prevention because of all of the things that I see and I experience in my daily um, footsteps coming from North Minneapolis and then working downtown Minneapolis and um, basically having downtown be my extended neighborhood for all of my life and. Um, and what's going on in North Minneapolis. And so I see um, mental health issues that are not deep mental health issues that are not being um, treated. You have all kinds of people walking around downtown Minneapolis right now in all different states of um, lucidness, not lucid, non-lucid. Um, many, many, many people experiencing homelessness Weekly, regularly, I see fights with big groups of teenagers. The last time I broke down sobbing, it was just so overwhelming because I was already watching the news. It's like the globe is on fire. We had the Afghanistan thing, you know, the that the height of that going on and so many things going on in the world. And so it breaks my heart when I'm downtown and I see mobs of teenagers uh, one one young lady was completely naked from the waist up. She chose to take off her shirt to fight another girl. Um, and, the, and this fight was going on while someone else was videotaping it. And then you have teenagers standing around and young people. One of them had a baby on their hip. So you have the toddler being traumatized and, and brought into this. And then I saw... Um, so first it was that fight, and then from that mob of people, it was a boy, two young teenage boys fighting, and one of the boys picked the other one up and body slammed them in the middle of the Nicollet Mall. I'm talking about this is right on 7th in Nicollet, in the heart of our downtown. He picked the young man up, body slammed him on the concrete. You could see the boy hit his head, his back, and this is just one incident. This is something I could report weekly of all the things that I see. And so what I would like to know when I think of violence prevention is how can we get to the root of helping people work through what they're, it, it just speaks to all of the other social issues that are escalating this because again, like all up and down the Nicollet Mall, you have people who are experiencing homelessness, chronically homeless, um, drinking, drugs. They sit on the shot spotters and roll up their blunts and smoke. And I just feel like right now this area, is it the city's way of kind of control? You know, like in San Francisco, they've relegated a lot of the homeless people to one area. So at least they kind of know where people are and what they're up to. I don't feel I don't feel safe right now. I don't feel like I can go anywhere without being concerned about not someone doing something to me, but some random act of violence that's going to occur because a, a fight breaks out and somebody starts shooting 
Um, the way people are driving is just is pedestrian safety is, is terrible. I don't even want to, just for the record, I'm a person who takes the bus. So I use public transportation. I am a pedestrian. I do a lot of walking. And so this is why I experience these things all the time. I don't have the privilege, which is my own choice, of being in a vehicle and I can drive to work and pull up. And, you know, I'm at my desk and then, you know, I drive back home. So I'm very much aware of these different things that I don't want to normalize either. This should not be normal. But when you live in this environment, the more you're exposed to it, the more normalized it becomes. And I'm not okay with that. So my response would be, the prevention of violence is a two competing priority, right? Because we don't want killer violent cops either. We don't want that either. You know, but what do, what do I do when I'm faced with a situation? I don't necessarily feel comfortable that some community member is going to step up and de-escalate a, a big public brawl amongst a, a group of youth. And so I'm wondering you know, I don't have access to all of the conversations that occur with within the city and what, but but what is being done? And then you have police parked all up and down the Nicollet Mall, so they're present in case anything major breaks occurs. But but a lot of times they're parked right there, and then now they're not getting involved. They're not really getting involved. So I feel like. The police is taking a break like, oh, OK, you don't like the way we do our job. Let's see how you do without us doing our job. Let's you. Oh, you want a community police? Let's see. Let's see how you handle that. So I think it's not one or the other. I sound like a politician right now. It's not one or the other. It's both. And but we do need reform within our definitely need reform. Um, but we also need healing within our community. We need accountability from our different communities. And we need to definitely, definitely place a focus on mental health because the mental health, I don't know, our city has exploded, I feel, or it's bubbled all to the surface now for all to see. Um, of so much, so many mental health issues and what services are in place for people. And then also holding each other accountable within our communities. And how do we govern ourselves within our communities? Because I have a big bone to pick with the police, but I also go to back to my community and they get mad at me. I'm not always popular in meetings because I say, okay, I get what you're saying, but we have power too. And what are we going to do with the power that we have? Like, why are our kids out here behaving this way? So there's, it, it's, it's a huge problem, a, a huge issue that we can't eat the elephant all at one time. But we, we definitely, we have to be more accountable in how we govern ourselves within our communities and having conversations there in mental health support. And winter is coming, so I don't know what the city plans to do with all of the people experiencing homelessness. They don't have anywhere to use the restroom. They're defecating, you know, all around downtown Minneapolis. It was so hot, the, and I'm going to be quiet, but I, I really got to get this off my chest. And I want you all to know what the hell is going on down here, okay, for this to be recorded or whatever, in case you don't know. It was so hot a few weeks back and it hadn't rained. I sat at the bus stop and I could smell day old urine wafting out of the alleyways, coming up out of the corners where people have used the bathroom in the city, hadn't, you know, come in sprayed and cleaned. You know, you could see the streets were dirty and it hadn't rained. And I'm not used to that. I'm from Minneapolis. And so I'm like, am I, am I like in New York City or am I in Minneapolis? Because it was just, this is where we're at. This is where we're at. So what do, so my priority again is violence prevention. Then I would say police re reform. Um, 
that's where I'm at with it. Thank you, Angelique. Well, um, very much. Um, Janet. Yeah, I'm with the violence prevention and a lot of what Angelique said. Um, um, my bus stop is at 12th and Lake and uh, it's very much, you know, I don't think there's a fighting there because the people are just a little older, but, you know, so many homeless and so many people um, with uh, drug addiction problems and um, the police are there a lot watching them, but that doesn't mean that two of them haven't been murdered lately and there's been shots up there again the last couple nights. So, um, you know, I feel so sorry for people who are not getting really any kind of services that they so desperately need. And, um, you know, Hurt people hurt people, so I think a whole lot of our our crime problems are are people who are just hurting. And I'm also for for replacing a whole lot of the police with grandmothers because I think it's an improvement <laughs> to have people who love young people. And and you know, I mean, I've worked with a lot of young people who have been in and out of gangs, and um, you know. All I really need is is just a, just a little bit of of help on finding their way. I mean, d abandoning them does not help them make better choices. I mean, um, having having um, older friends, I think, is a, very helpful for young people to make better choices. I'm 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 always preaching my in, my intergenerational ideas, but. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Janet. Um, Beth? I love that intergenerational idea, Janet. And um, I mean, I often think about when, when people have babies, they are just left to leave that hospital. And you cannot get a driver's license without having to go to driver's education. And you're given a pamphlet to read and you are given someone that teaches you how to drive somewhat. But you have a baby and you're just on your own. There is no, unless you've enrolled in something. So that idea of grandmothers going in and talking to people or making some kind of a how to parent and here are resources if you need help, because all these things go together. All these, you know, mental health and none of these things are, oh, I'm just interested in education. Oh, I'm just interested in, in violence prevention. Like these all go together. It's all being part of a community. Um, <coughs> So, so back to what annoys Paulette with that word holistic, I do still see it. I do think that I'm thinking of it right now just because if all these things could help in the community from an earlier age, maybe we could prevent some of these worsening, you know, horror stories like Angelique mentioned. And I know you're not the only one, Angelique, who's um, been talking about what's happening downtown. My husband's at, uh, teaches at St. Thomas. I mean, the changes of what's been going on downtown in Nickel and Mall, it's, it's um, and we just got back from New York. It's better. It feels a lot better in New York right now than here, actually. And Angelique, I see you have your hand up. I was just going to say we have to ask, how did we get here? Because I've never seen anything like what I'm seeing right now. Never. And that's coming through, you know, Murderopolis, the crack ep epidemic. Um, You've always had youth who fight, you've had gang violence, things like that, but I've never seen what I'm seeing right now. And it, it, the mental illness and then also the drug addiction, you know, and I've never felt unsafe before the way that I do now. And again, I don't think anything, anybody will do anything to me specifically it's the randomness. It could be a beautiful sunny day and everything's flowing, the birds chirping and the water's flowing. And then all of a sudden something just totally random will break out. People have nowhere to go to be. So they're standing around, you know, entertaining themselves the best way, the best way that they can. But how did we get here? And that's what the city of Minneapolis and the state of Minnesota, how did we get here? when we have more nonprofits than anywhere else in the United States. 
and people that are employed in these positions. How did how did we get here? Is it working? Is what we're doing working? That's my question for the city of Minneapolis. If anybody ever watches this in the state of Minnesota, how did we get here? And how do we get out of it? How do we work our way through this? And I don't feel safe for seniors. If I was a senior, I would, or if I, my grandmother, I would not want my grandmother on a city bus. I would not want my grandmother walking down the Nicollet Mall for the simple fact of maybe no one says a word to her or him, my grandparents. Maybe no one would bother them, but nobody wants to visually take that in every day, you know, to be experiencing, like, I no. It's not comfortable. It's not comfortable to have the police presence, you know, like, and it's a, it's a presence, but then it doesn't seem effective because you still see all of this stuff going on. So I don't even know why they're really all parked up and down the mall. And then I hear gunshots. If you live in North Minneapolis, so my neighborhood is quiet, but there's other areas where you go further north, it's an everyday occurrence. The first time I heard gunshots, I jumped off of my bed and I hit the floor because I had never heard gunshots before. And I said, is this firecrackers? You know, this was probably about like seven years ago. Now, sometimes if I'm tired enough, I just turn over in my bed and go back to sleep. And that's not okay. What's what's City of Office of Violent Prevention? But violence prevention, if you've used this, I'm very curious to know, like, what are your plans? Seriously, what are we doing? I've totally stopped calling on shops, shots fired. It's just all the time. And, that, and it's, that's not okay in the sense of you, that should not be normal. It should not be normal where you're like, no, I don't feel like calling tonight. When did our when did our city become this and what happened? There are no easy answers um, for that because it's multifactorial. I mean, it's all coming together. I mean, in my past life as a public health nurse, I worked with teens. So you have about four generations, especially people of color. A teen mom to get teen mom to get teen mom. So you got about four generations who have lost adult leadership. So therein lies one problem. So you have children raising children, raising children. And so they don't have the guidance that we have in my generation from the community to help share, share with you coping skills, how to do things, how to survive. So that's one big major major problem. Angelique that you're seeing. So the kids that's out there on Nicollet Mall, their moms and dad, I may be stereotyping, probably 14, 15 years older than them. And they're somewhere getting their own groove on. The great grandparents, <laughs> adding 15 years to that, maybe 48, 50 years old. These are great grandparents. So you're looking at a whole slew, uh, I call it arrested adults. I mean, ar arrested adolescents from about 52 on down. That you what that we deal with in our community. That's a big, huge problem right there. That's just one issue. So the rest of the things that, like you're saying, the things that we're seeing have become normalized. So people don't see it as any problem. Whereas we do. And so that's you gotta change that mindset. Then you have the easy access of guns that are that are that are in the communities. They don't want the NRA got a big jump on that and won't, don't want to stop that. So intense. And so you got a whole lot of steps that we got to do. It seems insurmountable, but like you said earlier, we got to take this elephant one bite at a time. But if you start pulling in all these factors that has gotten us to where we are, because we have incrementally accepted it as part of the normal state in our, in our environment. Now we are at the top of the volcano when stuff is all bubbling out and over. So that's, that's a good are. analogy. Yeah. At the so, top of the volcano. Been, yeah. And so all the stuff is bubbling up. It's been bubbling up. And now we are at the top and it's coming out over us. So there's no one solution. This is a whole 
community have to get together solution. And it's not politics and not bipartisan. It's everybody got to get together and say, you know, we got to get back to the basics and, and recognize what's normal and what's not normal. And don't, don't, and to stop giving us that it's okay to do this when you know it's not. Just like I said, it's a blunt. I mean, and, and so like you said, like for nine downtown years ago when they had that um, class, to Christina, that they brought us around when we brought to, they went up, brought us to, um, 311, but they had the cameras all around the city. So they, they see what's happening downtown Minneapolis. So they choose not to get into what you're saying. So they got eyes as big brothers, if you ever read 1984, big brother is here. They got cameras all over the place, seeing what's going on. Uh, but again, we have to, and it's a big chunk, and I don't know how we're gonna start it, but it gotta get started, but it's a big chunk that has to start the process and not just keep, let it keep bubbling up and keep going. Otherwise, you're gonna have more riots and races and mental health issues because people don't know how to deal with it. People don't have the coping skills. They don't have the insulation of the community like I have when I was coming up to help you. I can call somebody, I have auntie. I mean, it may not be a biological auntie, but in our community if I was coming up, an elder is gonna be auntie or your cousin, you know, your uncle. It don't have to be biological, but I know I'm safe with this person. Can they gonna take care of me? You can't trust that this day. I can't no. trust I'm not that good. I can't trust my neighbor. But I mean nowadays you could trust your neighbor to watch your kids back in the day. You can't do that anymore. There's no reason I mean the, the pedophiles looks like the the, the the pastor in the church. And so, you know, who are you gonna trust? There's a lot of big mistrust going on. All right, I'm off I my think, soapbox. Angelique. You, you asked a question about how, how did we get here? I think you have to recognize um, the schools emptied out last year because of the pandemic. They just emptied out. You cannot look at the situation that we're in today without recognizing we have just gone through a year and a half of a major worldwide pandemic. And, and the end is not in sight. But that's one factor, the schools emptied out. Now I have a good friend who lives in South Minneapolis six months out of the year. The other six months, she lives in Prague, the Czech Republic. That is the fifth safest city in the world. She's gonna have a hell of a time coming back here. A hell of a time. And she'll, she'll make the adjustment because she knows what to do, but we have to stop preaching to the rest of the world and recognize that the problems are here. And you know, when when you empty out the entire school system, and that was a failure, homeschooling was a failure, but it's a public health problem. So, I mean, may, maybe one of the answers is, I don't even know if the police force has truancy officers anymore. Uh, they probably don't. That's probably gone out of style. Uh, but um, maybe there would be another way of phrasing it. But I mean, I think public safety is not just, shouldn't just be focused around police. I mean, public safety is like, I'm not safe walking on the street. We don't even have the best you know, our pedestrian safety is appalling. People are are, are being um, killed right in front, right in front of the, the Hilton Hotel in the turnaround drive. Two people were killed by a runaway vehicle. That is public, that is public safety. Of course, the vehicle was stolen. But anyway, I, well, I that... vote for truancy officers and get the schools back and if they have to be masked, let them be masked, but get them back in school. That might solve at least 25% of the issues. I think this has been building though, even before, I mean, of course, COVID just pushed it over the edge, but it, this has been a problem even prior to COVID, at least in downtown Minneapolis. I mean, I could tell just story after story after story because I'm really just a part of it, of everything 
that I see. And I agree that pedestrian safety is also should be very important. Over north, some of the, you know, like off of the freeway, different intersections, you see bits of cars shattered all the time because someone has crashed into a corner. The speeding, it's just, everyone is just, I don't know what's going on, or I kind of do know what started it, but I'll be getting into political stuff for real then. But I feel like everyone's just doing what they want to do. And because our leadership and and people not a lot a, a lot of people not respecting the police and feeling even empowered now to whatever control the police did have, like a lot of people are now like, you don't have any control over me. I can do and say whatever I want to do. People are angry and they don't respect the, they don't respect the police. They cuss the police out from one end of the Nicollet Mall to the next. And so that's part of the issue too, is building good relations again, back with officers, peace officers in the community, because they're not respected. They are not respected, at least from where I see and I get part of the I get some reasons why but yeah. that's quickly and then um I did not have us walk through accepting the minutes which is I mean this is a great conversation I um and and we don't have to do that I don't want to interrupt momentum to do wishy-washy administration stuff we can certainly accept minutes um the next meeting we can accept both minutes today's and next but i did i did want to put that out there if we wanted to tie up that business too um i was just going to say regarding the truant officers i think that what replaced truant officers it became school counselors and social school social workers so that in the ideal world if it if a child wasn't showing up for school a social worker would reach out to the family if the family wasn't available, connect with the kid, find out what's going on in your life, you know, express support, try and get them involved in maybe some after school programs, get them wanting to come to school and try and problem solve with the family and with the with the kid. And unfortunately, I mean, I know, you know, I send my kids to public pub, Minneapolis public schools and I mean, year after year, we're told we have fewer and fewer counselors, fewer and fewer. There have been fewer support from my kids. And, you know, luckily, we're able to be very hands on with our kids. But we know not every family has that privilege. And ha it's a it's all community. And so, again, it's I really think if there were better counselors and more money going into education, then then we could try and help these kids so that by the time they were teens, Maybe they were going to programs at Boys and Girls Club. Maybe they were participating in after school activities. So they weren't just looking for things to do and trouble to get into because you have to fill their time and give people hope and a purpose. Thank you, Beth. Um, that was the last question. Um, does anybody want to add anything? Yeah, I think there should have been a fifth, there should have been a fifth um, point under because every one of those and I think prevention of violence is probably the most important thing, but it's not it's not a broad enough imagination of public safety. I mean, at public safety as such. It's your own sense of well being and and um, you know, if you want to break it down into each one of those very specific areas fine but i would say public safety is our social fabric that is our social fabric and i would have liked to have seen a, a fifth point because when the social fabric is is has is is becoming unraveled then there's no place for public safety so i think we need i'm going to use the word holistic I think we need to look at public safety like it is the social fabric of the entire city and it can't be broken down into each one of the it can be but then you have to go back to what what it is contributing to and if there is no social fabric the rest of it mean, means nothing means nothing if there is no social fabric 
So I would have liked to have seen a fifth, a fifth position there. And you can add that to your notes. Thank you, Paulette. Yeah, Hazel. I just want to ask, with this information, I think Angelica, somebody asked earlier, what are they going to do with this information? But I feel like I've been in a focus group, and I'm sick of focus <laughs> group, uh, because the, you're there and you never get the results of what you're doing. You, you ask the time, the gimmick suggestions, recommendations, whatever, and it never gets back to you. So how do you plan on using this? I will... Um... I feel like I should know this and and I do, but I don't want to misspeak um, because this is clearly um, very important. So let's see. It gave me talking points to frame it up and I was concerned about the time, so I know I probably didn't frame it up very well um, and that's on me. Um, Can I say one last thing? <laughs> just yes. You know, I remember in 2013, the city of Minneapolis talking about how they wanted to build density and having a plan in place for building the density, which means adding, you know, more taxpayers and more, you know, residents to the city of, of Minneapolis. And my question is, it sounds, or my statement is, it sounds really great to say we want to add density, but is the city of Minneapolis prepared to manage the density? Because we have these uh, very ambitious goals for occupying our city, but what about managing our city? I'm sitting out here, I'm sitting looking out the window right now at trash that people are just, it's just ridiculous to me what's going on right now. Are we prepared to manage this density that we're, wh where are people living? <laughs> where are they staying yeah. here in the city of Minneapolis? Yeah. You want to increase the, the tax base. You're not going to attract taxpayers. Tra taxpayers don't want to walk past trash and people sleeping in the streets and to be people loitering outside of the businesses that they go into that like, if you're a tourist and you come to Minneapolis, you don't want to walk out of your hotel into a brawl and all of and all of these things. And we have to do business here too, or we won't be this city that we are. Why are we a wealthy state and this is going on? Again, why do we have all these nonprofits and we still can't seem to tackle this? So, clearly I'm frustrated. Thank you. Hello here. Could I make a comment? Yes, Miss Flo. Uh, we need to look overall at policing at the various levels. We're looking only at MPD, but we have the uh, sheriff's office at the county level, and we have state troopers at the statewide level. And then, you know, National Guard and the military. And uh, how we can take an integrated look at policing, period. Uh, and uh, security and safety has been the number one issue uh, facing housing authorities and residents for decades, uh, and uh, MPHA, we need to incorporate here uh, because they're developing a partnership with the Metropolitan Council. Uh, and, uh, uh, and establishing a whole general, uh, look at all of this. And uh, uh, seven county uh, jurisdiction and flexibility of uh, moving to work federal regulations. And uh, we need to get a, uh, in, in, 
pulled them in into the uh, information exchange and discussion because the uh, safety security issue is a priority uh, across the, the fabric of our society uh, as a priority concern and how we can cooperate and collaborate in revisioning everything. Uh, and I'm, I'm uh, struck by um, uh, the um, uh, essential mission. We need to have a paradigm shift at, at how we do this and a we uh, prior I, I have a proposition to p prioritize uh, the, the preposition so that we're no longer at us to us paternalistically for us and center it on being from us and with us, and Thanks. of us, and by us, and, and put uh, the people uh, and, and residents at the top of the pyramid rather than the bottom. Thank you, Flo. Thank you for that. Um, it's 2.39. Um, I just want to be conscious, conscientious of everybody's time. Um, did we want to do a motion for the minutes and then I can give, um, I just sent out an email that uh, gave the context of what this conversation, um, like the frame up that was suggested. And there's also um, a link in that email to access uh, a compilation of the first phase of conversations. So feel free to click that link to see um, what, uh, how they framed all the engagement the first time. Um, and basically, so this is a year long process. As of now, that's the timeline. Um, and it is to continue to give uh, recommendations to city leadership on, um, on public safety, you know, policy and procedure, et cetera. Beth? Christina, since they asked us for input and our thoughts and advice, can we ask them to please send us what their recommendations are going to be once they've drafted them? Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Um, as a matter of fact, um, I know that there's going to be a lot more engagement, so um, I I don't want to misspeak at how many phases, but um, and of course the election's going to Right. influence all of this too right so right. there probably won't be anything coming out like super specific right. uh, until after the election i also think it could be um worthwhile if we asked for them to kind of expedite the process given what's been going on in the city instead of i mean i know all these you know wanting to get everyone's advice and wanting to get everyone's input and thinking about it and talking about it and having to get all the stakeholders involved and getting stakeholders involved is a good thing, but it also can be, you know, kind of the enemy of progress where like, if you wait too long, you know, all these things are still happening. So um, if, if there could be a note that we request, I don't know if you all agree, you know, um, maybe a quicker timeline than a year. Okay, thank you. Um, Hazel? I just wanted to ask, uh, are they going to do a compilation of what they're getting from all these various groups? So yes. Like, I mean, because I don't want to just hear uh, what they're recommending, what they're going to do. I want to know what are they pulling from the various groups? Are they utilizing information that they're getting from the community? I mean, because that's, yep. that's what I say. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of focus group because you do this, and when they come back with stuff, there's nothing that we discuss in our group that they come up with. So I just want to know. Are they actually going to use it? I mean, yeah. I like to see a summary. First sure. Back at, I like to see a summary of the compilation of what they've retrieved from the community. Sure. And then sure. I want to put it side by side with the recommendations and see if they're utilizing stuff that they're getting from the community. Okay. That's very Is fair. Is that doable? Yep. Okay. 
We need more public restrooms. <laughs> there are no public there are no public restrooms in downtown Minneapolis. There's and, not. And trash cans. And trash cans. You walk but around then your we need city someone to babysit the restrooms. That's the thing. We need restroom attendants. That's for, yeah. Well. Yeah. Because they tra they get trashed. That's why they locked them all up. But that that alone is a public health How safety issue. issue. Is there's no there aren't any restrooms and the trash is getting out of ridiculous. Like, that would I mean, be like, years ago they that stopped would be using like Paris. You know, Paris has always had um, public facilities right out in the open. You don't go so it's safe mostly for men, but no, really. Sorry. But I don't that, know about the open part, but no no no. They've got little <laughs> stalls. So it all you can see is from the head. Oh, like you okay, like the shower at the beach or you something. Just, no, you just step in, you're outside. I mean we're there's so a door. Up. No, there's a door. You know what I, I know what you mean. I know what yeah, you mean. Yeah, <laughs> but we're so and children, people pick up their kids and they put them over a sewer and the street and they and they let them pee and uh, <laughs> weren't you hung up about all of this so you have to do it privately behind a door i mean it works in paris uh it's all i'm saying okay. i have to make a decision whether or not i really want to stay in minneapolis it's getting that bad for me yeah that's There's fair no 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 comfortable place to go office of uh, violence prevention I'm looking dead into the camera if you see this. There's no foot, there's no, you know what the safest neighborhood right now is the North Loop. Amazingly, there's no issues down in the North Loop. You can go down there and have coffee and enjoy the beauty of the neighborhood, but I can't go uptown. Really not much going on North Side. Downtown is a done deal. Like every footstep right now. And, and what's up? That's for the for the camera. <laughs> All right, I'm done. I'm very, very passionate about this thing. I, 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 make, I, make I appreciate your words. I really do. There's always Iowa. <laughs> there, where do we but really? Where do you go? Where do you go right now? I would have to go back to my hometown in Iowa. And I'm Mom. seriously thinking about it. Why not? Mom. Mall of America, where dreams come true. I'm just I'm joking. I'm totally joking. <laughs> Some of us were born in you. Minneapolis, so we don't I have much you. choice. We can't go back to where we came from. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You know. The yeah. No, for sure. Um. You need a motion for to accept the minutes. That would be <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I, I make a motion to accept the minutes. I'll second. So, <laughs> Tom, did you get that? That was Paulette and Janet. All in favor? <laughs> Aye. 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 And thank you, Christina. Yeah. yeah. I'm definitely not very good at sharing this meeting because <laughs> I forgot all that stuff and the agenda. We just launched into it, although it, we didn't officially like accept the agenda. I suppose we could, but I said if anybody has an, an issue or a challenge to please speak up and We'll just take that as everybody was cool with the agenda. And I don't have to, I mean, for our minutes, that's great. Um, but when we post what's called a marked agenda for public view, um, it doesn't state like who made the motion and who seconded. Um, are we going to add, are we going to circle back to the senior linkage line and talking about? I was wondering. Just because I felt like otherwise it's unfinished business. There's no point in us talking to the senior linkage line if we're not going to. Yep. So for for our next month's agenda, we can bring up the senior linkage line. Um, I will reach out to them to see what they do with the conversation, where they took the conversation. Um, I am filling in for staff. Um, for the uh, uh, Committee on People with Disabilities. And so I wanted to talk with them um, to see if, um, you know, how they felt about 
maybe having a, a joint meeting to have a conversation at some point. So, mm -hmm. and the recommendation it's, it's, basically was, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Was one, do a focus group. Okay, thanks for another focus group. And to rally with um, the, was it the feds or the federal monies, you know, write a letter mm -hmm. recommending that they get more funding so that yep. they have the capacity to operate. Right. So right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I will definitely uh, circle back with them. Mm -hmm. um, and I will be sending out um, a link to a survey. We're collecting data for the next iteration of the action plan. Okay. Um, the focus is going to be uh, specifically mm -hmm. on our communities of color um, mm -hmm. and other historically underrepresented communities such as mm -hmm. LGBTQAI plus elders. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll send that out. And there was one other thing we I wanted to. Oh, huh, our bylaws don't even get me started on those. So <laughs> I'm going to send out a draft um, of some of the recommend or the the things that people brought to me. Um, I'm going to make some tweaks and adjustments, and I'll send it out mm -hmm. for us just to look over. Hey, are these new? Is, is the, are the bylaws cleaned up? Because there is still some ambig ambiguity mm -hmm. on quorum, on terms, kind of that stuff. So, are we going to? Um, I mean, I probably only have two more meetings, and then I'm done after the election. But are are you? I sent you some stuff about pedestrian safety, um, and what <laughs> how St. Paul is so far ahead of Minneapolis in terms. Oh of yeah, they've always safety. been. Yeah, they have always been. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's good. Yeah, um, let me, let me and the about University of Minnesota um, doing a study and, and bringing pedestrian safety up to, um, the, uh, I don't know, are you going to, are we going to have that on the agenda or not? We can, we sure can. Um, we have tons and tons and tons of studies. Like we do walking studies, safety studies, all kinds of stuff. We have plenty of studies. <laughs> so we, we, I guess I think I would want to know what we would want to talk about. And Hazel, I know your hand is up. Yeah, I just want to make sure that you send that resource that I sent to you, uh, but that I got from that uh, public health nurse. Janet. Oh, I, I sent you. Yep. That resource. Uh, you tell you guys can get that copy. But I'm also going to talk with Dorothea Harris. She sent me another a resource about uh, helping. Uh, seniors in home and it sounds like a really good deal but i need to talk to Trace with her when i get that information i'll send it to christina so you guys can see it again because okay. i was i was really getting down depressed that we couldn't get to something concrete to help seniors in your home because there was a was coming block you know no funding to get it together anyway yeah. this other the resource seems like it's a uh, all encompassing so it looks pretty good so okay. and it came another day Will you please, when you do have resources, will you send them to me or send it to all of us, I suppose, like hey, Miss Hazel did, and then I can add it to our newsletter. Um, yeah, for sure. That goes out to all our, our older adults. Yep, absolutely. Yep. Okay. Well, I'm going to have to scoot off because I have a three o'clock, another Zoom I got to get you ready for. <laughs> You're a busy woman, Miss Hazel. So tech savvy, yeah. too. No, yeah, I'm so not fixing. I'm not that. You're doing I'm it. You're fun. doing it. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank um, I know this brand. Good to see you all. Yeah, thank but you. Okay. great and information. Thank you, and I will, yep, I will definitely be sharing this with um, OVP. Good. <laughs> you take yeah, mine and let them know I was talking to the camera. <laughs> yeah, that was it. Well, you're going to see me on a camera like this. You're going to be like, Angelique told us. Now she's on the 5 o'clock news. <laughs> it could be because I got in trouble with the police, or it could be I was a victim. I don't want to be on it for either reason. <laughs> don't throw that out to the universe, Angelique. Do not throw that out to the universe. Okay, okay I take it back. I take it back. I take it back. All right. It's I'll all good. Universe. Bye, bye. bye. All right, bye. Angelique, oh. Angelique, can you add us all to your newsletter? Yes, if that's okay. If that's yeah. okay, I will do that. Yeah. I will send you the emails. Okay. And Beth, before I don't before you end, Christina, Beth, I did contact Cyber Seniors. So they're we're gonna be zooming because we need people to come and teach some classes this fall. 
Awesome. I saw that you did. I so, saw the. Oh, you did? I saw oh. it come through. I was in New York or somewhere. And, okay. I mean, so okay. just so but anyway, know. good. And let me know if it doesn't move forward because then I'll bug okay. them. Okay. Okay. Right. Thanks. All right. And Arlen. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs> See y'all. Bless you.